Welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery Programming Series for our current show, A New World, Ohio Women to Watch 2023, a collaboration with the Ohio Advisory Group of the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, D.C. Today, we are thrilled to present artist Callista Lyon. As a brief re reminder, everyone tuned in today is in listen-only mode. Please feel free to utilize the chat function to ask your questions, and we'll be sure to get to them in the Q&A portion of the hour. Also, please keep in mind that because we're presenting from separate locations, there may be some variation of bandwidth. So if one of us freezes up or the sound fluctuates, thanks in advance for bearing with us. All right. Thanks, everyone. And welcome, Callista. Thanks, Kat. Um... Hi y'all, um, my name's Callista Lyon. Um, I just wanted to start with an enormous thank you to Kat Sheridan for all your energy in making this exhibition possible and to also making the touring life of this show um, happen. Uh, also a big shout out to the Rife team who were really helpful during installation. And thank you to the Ohio Advisory Group of the National Museum of Women in the Arts for making an opportunity like this for women artists possible. It's a gift. This is a photograph of the stolen land of the Dwadawara peoples. Today, it is known by the name Talangata Valley. Talangata is an Aboriginal word meaning place of many trees. It is a small regional farming community in Victoria, Australia. My family have raised cattle on this land since 1944. My understanding of community has been deeply shaped by my experience of living in this place and by the experience of relationships in place. The intimacies between my family, our farming community and the larger ecology of water, plants, animals, earth and weather. I'm continually working toward a form that might hold the complexity of these relationships and their histories. And in many ways, I believe this is the story that I'm trying to share. I use a research-based approach when working with images, which often involves performance, installation, and community-engaged works that work to explore the dynamics of narrative and memory in the wake of ecological and social collapse. Uh, an earlier project of mine, Talangata Valley, um, documented those who lived in this farming community. Through making this work, I met Philip Branwhite. Phil was an amateur botanist and a self-described recluse. He spent over 30 years searching for and documenting native orchids. The word amateur in its beginnings means one who loves or to love. Phil carried this magnifying glass with him religiously. The next few images I'm going to share were taken by Tobias Hayashi. Um, he's a PhD candidate who is studying orchid pollination at the Australian National University. Tobias has been super generous in allowing me to incorporate his photographs into my performances and installations. There are around 1,800 native species of orchids in Australia. An orchid's color, form, and pheromones are often modeled on their specific pollinator. They are an example of a species that demonstrates the ways their lives are intertwined with other species. This is the helmet orchid, the common or large bird orchid, the flying duck orchid, the red beard orchid, the Brindabella midge orchid, and the crimson spider orchid, Caledonia concolor, which has become a focus in my work of the past. Around 40% of these species are threatened with extinction in Australia. Through my friendship with Phil, he began to share his work with me. Across his life, he created an extensive collection of botanical specimens, illustrations, and field diaries. Phil's botanical illustrations were possible through close studies of stem and flower cuttings that he collected both locally and across Australia. With Phil's permission, I worked with his collection to create an extensive digital archive of his little known work. From this archive, I've been moving in ever widening circles to understand this collection 
as both a demonstration of attention, care, and interspecies relation, but also a collection with a legacy rooted in colonial violence and extraction. It was really, for me, a place to begin, a way to research orchids and the myriad relationships they build across species as an embodiment of community, with the specific goal of centering non-human narratives as critical historical actors. To look at an orchid is to look at ourselves, a way to understand the intertwinings of past, present and future with the understanding that what these orchids are currently experiencing through mass extinction, we are also enacting upon ourselves. I personally don't believe their lives can be separated from ours. I became really fascinated by Phil's sectional botanical drawings. Um, these sort of curious forms drew me in to a more intimate world. These fragments of a larger body allowed for a reimagining, for the possibility of a new community to emerge. I began making three dimensional clay models from his drawings. Previously, I had little worked with clay, but the relationship of hand to earth felt like a natural way in which to be in proximity to these little lives. While I wasn't able to articulate it when I was making this work, it was through um, making the work that I began to ask, what is the artist, what is the role of the artist as a translator? These bodies now form a counter archive made by the hand, a way to think through and complicate the colonial archive. This form of making was a way of being in relation with these species not physically, but at a distance. Jacob Metcalf's term, intimacy without proximity, was helpful in thinking through the ways we might be in relation, in community, when physical proximity is not always possible or advantageous. How can we draw from our material vestiges to create new kinds of knowledge that share a rendering of a community rarely seen, yet deeply impacted by our ways of living? This work was a way of making visible, a way of recognizing the lives of others. My proximity to their pressed body, bodies tethered me to them forever. Across a long period of time making these creatures, I learned a kind of care for them. I collaborated with Cuban performance artist Sahili Tomeo to activate a relationship with these creatures in the gallery. An Intimacy of Strangers is an exhibition that grew out of ideas from working with Phil's archive. I was asking, what are the implications for understanding how we are together? I'm gonna to share two works from this exhibition. Becoming With is an attempt to try to understand what it is like to become another species. The figure of the human hand has been important in my work for two central reasons. Firstly, the use of the hand for embodied communication. And secondly, it was prehension the action of gripping or grasping alongside the brain that has allowed humans to dominate earth. 
cultural theorists have posited that the human hand was our earliest symbolic tool, making possible humans' first form of representation, leading to our first form of a manual sign language. These are cameraless images that I created by lighting an older generation office scanner to register a form of intimacy through the narrow depth of field produced by a digital scanner. I then layered the images together using digital manipulation. In this work, I use the image as a document of performance, transforming the hand into a symbol embodying the spider orchid, prompting a human decentering and a way for me to think from the perspective of an orchid. Also in this exhibition was a work titled Asymmetrical Encounters after Carla Hustack and Natasha Myers, a poem printed on found bookend papers. Through the layering of bookend papers, I was referencing the lineage and inheritance of Western knowledge practices in the sciences. The poem draws from language I read in scientific papers describing the relations between orchids and their pollinators. And this was specifically in chemical ecology. The poem reads, asymmetrical encounters, aggressive, pseudo, unilateral, antagonistic, steal, dupe, exploit, competition, infect, colonize, parasitize, pest, deceive, deceit, deception, constrain, threat, reward, fraud, swindle. Drawing on poetry's possibility in creating images via language, through this work I was interrogating how we tell stories through forms of scientific knowledge, previously presumed objective, that hold biases that shape how we come to understand ourselves and others. Becoming with, along with this work, function as a form of image and text that work to share a narrative about interspecies relationships across the exhibition. A Violent Unmaking is an installation that uses projection-based collage to make visible a history of colonial exploitation that has and is affecting a box iron bark forest ecology in the state of Victoria, Australia. This ecology is named after the box and iron bark tree species that make up this habitat. Um, this species create an abundant nectar and pollen and it creates a, an incredible home uh, to array of species that thrive on the gifts of these trees. The interwoven images point to the complex web of relations present in an ecology and map the threats to the endangered crimson spider orchid. I tend to naturally think with images and I use collage strategies to make visible forms of cognitive mapping. For example, um, this projection depicts an image of a box iron bark forest ecology at two different time points. The central image is drawn from this stereoscopic image taken in 1865. Um, this ecology, once a box iron bark forest, was extensively cleared for open pit gold extraction. This is one of only two ecologies where the crimson spider orchid grows. The image I used to just surround the historical image is a photograph made by an amateur botanist and conservationist, Peter Branwhite. Um, he's pictured in the back, um, standing with a beard. Um, Peter was Philip Branwhite's brother. Phil passed away during the making of this work and I began to work really closely with Peter. Devastatingly, Peter unexpected, unexpectedly also passed away two years later while I was working with him. Um, after the death uh, of Peter, I was given his photographic archive. The collection encompasses around 15,000 images and the photographs document a specific box iron bark forest near my family's farm. Approximately 83% of box iron bark forests in Victoria have been destroyed. Peter, along with another amateur botanist, Kerry Foley, rediscovered the crimson spider orchid in this habitat in 1994. Previously, um, this orchid was thought to be extinct. Peter worked tirelessly for 10 years to have this orchid listed as an endangered species. 
He spent years photographing this ecology um, because he really believed that if we could understand what was present and living in the area, we had a much better chance of protecting it. I wanted to share with the public a way to understand the complex interconnections that have and are shaping this ecology. I interweave images from Peter, Phil, and other local amateur botanists, my family's archive, my own lens-based practice, and national archives to speak to the specificity of place while also speaking to larger cultural changes taking place in Australia and abroad. A constant theme around this research is the impossibility of knowing, of attempting to comprehend the complexity of these histories so that I might be uh, able to imagine a new or old way of living that doesn't replicate this kind of violence. I've tried to work through these questions materially. Um, the projection screens were built using found timber and screws and the overhead projectors and milk crates were purchased secondhand. I have felt that understanding the complexity of a problem and communicating that to a public feels like a necessary step to address our current crises. As photography moves well beyond its traditional definitions, where the proliferation and circulation of images sustain a media saturated world, I ask how can we draw on personal collections and archives to share complex ways of animating ideas and stories? This research um, led me to make The Unknown and the Unnamed. It's a two hour and 15 minute expanded cinema performance. While this work began with Philip Branwhite's Orchid Collection, it is now expanded significantly to draw from the oral histories of amateur botanists, conservationists, farmers, scientists, along with botanical and photographic archives. And I draw extensively from literary and scientific research. Um, some key thinkers that helped me to undertake an approach to this work was Anna Singh's The Mushroom at the End of the World. This work has been really critical in how to center a narrative on um, a specific species and how to grapple with complexity within that narrative. Donna Haraway's Staying with the Trouble emphasizes the importance of story and interspecies and non-human narratives and how ideas of symbiosis can be used to demonstrate relation. Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass offered the poetics of understanding the limitations of scientific knowledge and how indigenous life worlds can help us unlearn violent ways of thinking and being. And Victor Stephenson's Fire Country makes explicit the ways Australian indigenous cultural fire practitioners are using fire to read and manage land, land and species health. And finally, Walter Mignolo and Catherine Walsh's on decoloniality has offered numerous examples of how art can serve as a fissure or a crack in the colonial matrix of power. Seven performers work in unison to move over 1200 images on and off analog overhead projectors, while field recordings and interviews play aloud. And I narrate a hundred page creative nonfiction text that I'm researching and writing. The performance translates scientific concepts through personal story for a general audience. I use symbiosis, which is defined as a mutually beneficial relationship between different organisms as a metaphor for community, challenging dominant narratives of human individualism. Through this work, I share how bodies across species are made and unmade by one another, orchid, cow, fungi, human, wasp. Across the narrative, I explain the importance of symbiosis as a way to challenge dominant narratives falsely drawn from scientific investigations about the biological individual and used to perpetuate, perpetuate ideas of human individualism and competition as a central way we function in the world. These false ideas have been used in fields like economics, philosophy and politics, and have gone on to deeply shape how we think and live in dominant Western culture. 
I make visible the ways that imperialism has been inseparable from botanical collecting and knowledge production, revealing the ways racial and environmental violence are deeply intertwined. And for me, this work is an example of the expanded field of photography, where I use the still image within an interdisciplinary and community engaged narrative form. This really allows me to draw on the power of an image and challenge the static photographic object and its encompassing abstractions. With each new iteration of this performance, I've worked with high school, undergraduate and graduate students to perform this work. The unknown and the unnamed not only works to share narratives of how we are collaborative beings, but through the research, rehearsals and staging of the performance, the work itself enacts community. The archive is a kind of memory. Phil attempted to move these orchids into the future, to me and to you. But what is missing in the archive? What has been lost and forgotten? What of the experiences, the relations, the exchanges that remain unknown? You couldn't escape the smell. It blanketed the air, our clothes, our hair. For over six weeks, I could look directly at the sun. On the worst day, I was on a truck at the top end of the valley. We had fire approaching from three sides of the valley, and we thought it would be the day that everything would burn. I watched the fire move out of the bush onto cleared farmland. It moved so quickly and intensely, like water spreading across a table when you knock over a glass. Orchid delirium, often also called orchid mania, was only possible through the expanding of imperial networks of trade and colonization. In Orchid, a cultural history, Jim Endersby states, behind all this was money, vast fortunes, often built on the scarred and suffering backs of African slaves, which brought Europe wealth on, on an unprecedented scale. How much of the knowledge I'm sharing with you today was made possible through slavery, through the colonizing of indigenous people and the taking and owning of earth and their ecological communities. To draw from Christina Sharp's In the Wake on Blackness and Being, how are we to come to understand the complexity and complicity of an event that is still ongoing? What does saving a species actually mean? When is a species saved? And if an orchid's home and their subsequent relationships do not have a future, might they have to be saved forever? What does saving a species in perpetuity look like? And what would happen to this species after we are gone? Conservation scientist Nush Farida has stated that for the orchid family, many species face imminent extinction. The crimson spider orchid is no exception. While the threats to this orchid are difficult to map, what has caused these threats is not. Humans. More accurately, humans from the period of colonization to the present. White colonial settlement, a way of living, a way of being, an idea. Moving on, um, Remembering Future um, is a public artwork created for the Biennial Facade Commission at the La Trobe Art Institute in Bendigo, Australia. Uh, the installation is a vinyl adhesive affixed to large glass panels on the front of the Institute. During nightfall, the work is backlit by fluorescent lighting and during the day by daylight. This work extends my research of the ecological impact of gold extraction on the box iron bark forest and woodlands in Victoria, Australia. This image was taken by Andrew Bennett, who is a professor of ecology at La Trobe University. I wanted to include a contemporary reference of this ecology in the collage. 
Victorian box ironbark forests and woodlands are primarily made up of red ironbark, grey box, yellow, bo yellow gum, red box and mugger ironbark. Uh, I'll be referencing Susan Lawrence and Peter Davies' book Sludge, Disaster on Victoria's Goldfields, which has been incredibly helpful in understanding this history of extraction in the region. In Sludge, they write, in the 19th century, Victoria was the centre of a global resources boom, end quote. Box iron bark ecologies are now considered one of the most endangered habitats in Australia and are synonymous with gold. Their roots intertwine with auriferous soil, which is gold bearing rock and minerals. Box iron bark forests were situated almost entirely within the Victorian gold fields. This region is called the Golden Triangle, an area aggressively and extensively mined during the Victorian gold rush. Scientists estimate that 83% of these forests and woodlands have been destroyed by colonization, primarily through gold extraction beginning in the 1850s and then continued through settlement and agricultural practices. Only 17% of these forests and woodlands remain. Most of the imagery that I collected for Remembering Future was sourced from state and national archives that make public colonial artist artifacts, including drawings, paintings, prints, and photographs. I centered on collecting imagery from the Bendigo region from the 1850s through to the early 1900s. This imagery was primarily created to document the landscape and daily activities of gold mining and settlement. After learning more about the box ironbark forests and woodlands, I became really interested in the history of gold mining and the impact it had on this specific ecology in Victoria. I was asking questions such as, how has gold extraction affects, affected this ecology? How can I use artist artifacts to visualize how this area has been changed through gold extraction? And how can I share a work that holds aspects of these changes across time? And how is this relevant and important today? In this research paper, Australians box ironbark forests and woodlands, saving the fragments of a threatened ecosystem, Max Kelly and David Mercer write, quote, timber extraction for a variety of uses during the mining era was high with licensed woodcutters and others producing wood for fires, shelter, whips and whims, puddling machines, sluices and water races. Mines also required timber for props, to line the shafts and tunnels and to feed the steam engines and furnaces. The spread of railway lines increased the demand for timber, particularly red iron bark and gray box, both which were considered suitable for sleepers, end quote. This image of the Ballarat goldfields was particularly shocking to me. I came to understand the extent of timber felling during this period and that the treescapes of the goldfields today are char characterized by extensive coppiced regrowth. When discussing Forest Creek, the site of gold discovery by Europeans in 1851, Davies and Lawrence write, quote, Almost every tree for miles in all directions was cut down to slab the mines or feed the boilers, end quote. I became really interested in these details of the artworks. The rendered landscapes offered a kind of evidence of these changes. I started to collect cropped image sections of the tree stumps. No longer did these images um, primarily document human life on land, but centered on the felled trees as the central character. I collected hundreds of these tree stumps, cropping them from the larger artworks. For me, seeing them together offered a powerful form of evidence that speaks to the extractive nature of hunting for gold. I then layered the images digitally, printed and cut out the images. I began to arrange them as a physical collage, moving and shuffling images until there was a kind of logic um, to the design of the work. In the final collage, the tree stumps make up the majority of the images depicted and are interspersed with around five other sets of images, 
which I don't have a lot of time to go into detail about, um, but I will talk about briefly. Um, I focused on the earth, sand, clay and gravel that was unearthed via mining practices. Um, again, I contoured, created layouts, printed and cut the images out by hand and placed them um, to create a new foreground. Through this research, I was also interested in trying to understand how water was diverted, used, polluted, and returned to rivers in gold extractive operations. Um, this particular image um, is of sludge slowly moving down Spring Creek in Dalesford in 1858. Lawrence and Davies write, quote, sludge was the colloquial word for the thick semi-liquid slurry of sand, clay, gravel, and water that flowed out of mining operations in Victoria. In the mid-1850s, Bendigo miners collectively discharged as much as 67 million litres of sludge each day into the Bendigo Creek. That meant that nearly 44,000 tonnes of dirt were sent downstream from, from the Bendigo diggings alone every single day, end quote. Uh, this is a map created by Lawrence and Davies. Um, the red outlines the Victorian rivers affected by mining sludge in 1886. And they go on to write that sludge affected three quarters of catchments in the state due to the large number of small mining operations spread over hundreds of creeks and gullies across the colony. The impacts of sludge to rivers and farmland filled newspapers for more than 50 years and generated numerous parliamentary inquiries. Today, the impacts are largely forgotten and unrecognized, as are the continuing impacts on aquatic systems, end quote. I used Lawrence and Davies' map of the rivers affected by sludge in Victoria, and I sourced contemporary images of water from those rivers. Again, I made selections, creating a collection of images that I would use in the collage. Um, in the Dickers mining record, um, they declared in 1863 that, quote, water is only another name for gold, end quote. Lawrence and Davies write that successful water networks generated considerable wealth for their owners and created a new class of capitalists, the water bosses, end quote. And so water races were built of timber and were constructed to woo move water to mines. Um, this is a map of a series of water race networks. In the collage, I used these images of water taken from the affected rivers to create references to the water races constructed on the gold fields. Looking through the archives, there are many images of miners working above and below ground. As I mentioned earlier, the human hand um, has been an important part in my work. In this case, the miner's hand represents the change agent. By cropping the images tightly, they begin to degrade, the pixels and digital artifacts becoming visible, a sign that these once analog images have been through a series of digital processes. I draw from artist and theorist Hildo Sterl's term, the poor image, where she writes, quote, that the poor image is a copy in motion. Its quality is bad, its resolution substandard. As it accelerates, it deteriorates. It is a ghost of an image, a preview, a thumbnail, an errant idea, an itinerant image distributed for free. The poor image has been uploaded, downloaded, shared, reformatted, and re-edited. It transforms quality into accessibility. In the overall collage, I place the miners' hands on the outer edge of the work, interspersing them with images of the tree stumps. Side by side, we see the hands and the result of their actions. These three images presented with an arrow are from the Environment Protection Authority Victoria and are offered to the public to aid the recognition of different types of historic mining waste in the Goldfields region. From top left, these include waste rock, or what is often called mullock, mining sand, worked alluvium, and calcined sand. I include these images because of the risks of mining tailings. Tailings are the materials left over after the process of separating the valuable material from the uneconomic fraction of rock or sediment. 
In the research paper, Historical Mercury Losses from the Gold Mines of Victoria, Susan Lawrence and Davis, Peter Davies write that, quote, legacy tailings from historical gold mining may also present ongoing risks as the industry used large quantities of mercury with minimal environmental regulation to limit its discharge. Tailings also contain cyanide. Tailings generated um, via a chemical leaching process, which uses small quantities of cyanide to extract fine gold from sulfide minerals, which coexist in the rock and sediment, often called ore. I also incorporated images that reflect contemporary uses of gold today, including dentistry. I'm sure a few of you watching may have um, a little bit of gold in your mouth. Um, they also make up Olympic gold medals. Uh, this is an image of my mother's engagement ring and an image of my laptop, which contains gold in the plating of circuit boards. Uh, gold is used in many electronics. And so why is it important to think about how and why gold is used today? Uh, because the, this extraction is not history. It is ongoing. Approximately 20 kilometres away from where this work was exhibited is the Fosterville gold mine, which is actively extracting gold. Um, this image that you're looking at is a bird's eye view of the mine site from Google Images. Um, this is an underground gold mine owned by Agnico Eagle um, Mines Limited, a Canadian company. In March of this year, Agnico celebrated the production of its four millionth ounce of gold and has transformed this mine into one of the world's richest gold mines. So through this work, I'm really asking how as artists can we make the histories of extraction visible to continue to trouble this damaging past and present. And some helpful writing um, uh, has been from the journal Insight and where Ryan Tebow writes that practices of repurposing found materials is and can be a site for creative in intervention, one that enables new possibilities for preserving and representing individual memory within a larger historical consciousness. And he goes on to write that the counter archive represents an incomplete and unstable repository an entity to be contested and expanded through clandestine acts, a space for impermanence and play taken as an action, the term entails mischief and imagination, challenging the record of official history. Employed as an artistic strategy, it pushes our archival impulse into new territories, encouraging critique and material alteration, fabrication and emboldening anarchivism. To counter archive is to counter act, to rewrite, to animate over. So really I consider a lot of the work that I do with archives as a, as a counter archival practice. Um, the final project I'm gonna be sharing today um, is currently on view at the Rife Gallery as part of the Women to Watch exhibition. Uh, Breaking Water is a collaboration with feminist artist and writer, Carmen Wynant. Um, and I'll be sharing images from a few different installations of this work. Breaking Water centers on the human experience of what psychologists have termed ecological grief, which refers to the sense of loss, fear, sadness, and dread that arises from experiencing or learning about environmental destruction. Carmen and I asked, how might human experiences with water signal a shift in consciousness? away from helplessness, denial and paralysis towards something like awakeness and, and action in addressing ecological imperatives. The largest installation has consisted of 21 secondhand CRT televisions and they sit on tables built from recycled material. Um, quite often it's the material from uh, the museum of past artist installations. The TVs form a circle around the viewer after they enter the space. And there is an audio component that shares a recorded narrative for the viewer in the center of the circle. The imagery depicts moments in which dormant potential energy bursts into an unstoppable force. We collected found video footage from YouTube, television and cinema in three main categories. Firstly, of water flowing, bursting, and erupting and gushing. 
secondly, the rupture of the amniotic sac being broken in the human body, a signal of oncoming birth. And dam walls exploding during river restoration projects. Um, these long-term collaborative projects remove failing or unused dam wall infrastructure to reconnect river pathways. This reinstates aquatic connectivity, including migratory fish pathways that often have been disconnected for upwards of 100 years. Breaking Water explores how experiences with and of water in the body, human and river, might offer a way to break through the idea of the individual into collective forms of care and repair. For Carmen, childbirth was a movement toward the care of another. For myself, dam removal demonstrates collaborative care, a form of unlearning that has been described by Jenny O'Dell as manifest dismantling, where, we, where many different groups work collaboratively to deconstruct settler imaginaries that work to command and control water. So at the beginning of the project, in thinking about how we might create the audience experience, we witnessed the way that larger bodies of water were made visible from a distance through the interplay of light on the surface of the water. Of water. Um, we began to explore the affective qualities of light, how both image and light paired together might also replicate a sense of this breaking through that we point to through the bodily experience of and with water. We tested different iterations. This was a three channel digital projection, but it didn't really offer the type of light that we were looking for. We were also working with low resolution footage that often didn't hold up when being projected large scale. Um, when we started testing the CRT TVs, their physical presence rendered the experience of image and a quality of light that we were looking for. And it was a way to reuse obsolete technology. We collected a number of the TVs primarily through Facebook Marketplace, which involved a process of meeting with strangers. I really enjoyed this part of making as it's a way to share the ideas of the work with different communities that may not ever visit an art space. Um, when thinking about using the TVs, we were looking at artworks like Gretchen Bender's 1987 work, Total Recall, and Spencer Finch's 2000 and work, West sunset in my motel room. The recorded audio component of Breaking Water drew from a text that Carmen and I researched and wrote collaboratively. The audio loops continuously and is 24 minutes in length. The audio shares personal story alongside excerpts from environmentalists, org reports like American Rivers, through to central texts that influence our thinking, including Australian feminist theorist, Astrida Nemes's essay, Hydrofeminism Hydro or On Becoming a Body of Water, which really brings together queer ecological and feminist ideas to demonstrate how we are all constituted of and by water and how water can be used to demonstrate our interconnectedness. Anthropologist Andrea Ballesteros, A Future History of Water, where she conducts conducts field work with state officials, NGOs, politicians, and activists who are fighting to establish water as a human right. Um, through her book, we come to understand the ways that we must move beyond an imagined future revolution to act daily in the capacities that we, that we can. Uh, quote, the world in front of us is the only actionable one, end quote. And Andreas Mams, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, Learning to Fight in a World on Fire, which looks to radical activist practices to address the current inaction on climate change. Mam argues for property destruction and violence, necessary steps in addressing our current ecological predicament. When thinking through the audio component of the work, we drew from artists including Ronnie Horn's 2021 monologue, Saying Water. In the center of the installation, we had a circular bench. Inlaid in the bench was a collection of takeaway screen printed posters. The poster was printed on recycled news, newsprint, which will fade over time. The poster drew from both the images and the text of the work to offer a takeaway for the viewer. In these images of the poster, you can see some of the key moments of the audio translated to print.
In Photography Archive and Memory, Karen Cross and Julia Peck write, the point of critically analyzing photography and its archives is to provide the grounds for a reconfiguration of knowledge, its ownership and modes of production. The motivation of the broader critique of photography and the archive is to make way for the expression of counter memories. So breaking water makes visible collaborative environmental actions that are dismantling dams that no longer serve a purpose. As I mentioned, Jenny O'Dell's use of the term anthropocentric waste, which is tied to dominant narratives, have attempted to command and control water to the detriment of rivers and their ecological com communities and most people. Through collecting the footage of dam demolitions, I watched and listened to Indigenous tribes, local communities, activists, scientists, governmental agencies, and environmental organizations watch dam walls be violently deconstructed, dismantled, and destroyed. I witnessed ecstatic faces, crying, screaming, clapping, folks jumping up and down and embracing one another, sometimes all at once. Um, I personally would describe this as an embodied collective joy. Through making this work, I've witnessed the potential of water to be emancipatory. When you fight for and with water, a collaborative effort, a moving beyond yourself, it looks like a kind of freedom. From the beginning, we have wanted to ask, can water transition us? What is the shape of collaborative action in the face of helplessness, denial, paralysis? How might we approach change as a matter of unlearning? What is left of me without the parts made in the image of colonization, racism and patriarchy? What surfaces when I release the idea of myself as individual? American Rivers. A powerful movement is underway to restore healthy, free-flowing rivers by removing dams that no longer serve a purpose or cause more harm than good. A powerful movement. A powerful movement. A powerful movement. A powerful movement. On the day that I was born, a midwife came to my parents' small apartment in San Francisco. It was a pink stucco house on top of an overpass that the city demolished years ago. My mom served her some tea between contractions and they decided to break the water. Um, thanks so much for tuning in and allowing me to share my work with you all. Thank you so much, Calista. I'm going to go ahead and um, pin both of us. And then folks, as you have questions, go ahead and pop those into the chat and we'll get to them. Um, so I'm curious, Calista, how did you how did you choose art or how did art choose you? Oh, I think probably art chose me. Um, I think as a kid growing up on a farm, I had a lot of time to be with myself and be in the world um, in a way that maybe a city offered more different things to do potentially. Um, and so I just, I started building things on the farm when I was a kid, started making objects and before I sort of really even knew that it was art. And um, that practice happened when I was young. And then I sort of felt like I wanted to do something creative um, for my job. And my dad was really into um, amateur photography. And so he taught me how to use a camera. And I took classes um, at my high school and decided um, to study at a technical school in Australia um, uh, after I left school. And so I got into it that way and then I worked commercially um, as a photographer, as an assistant initially and as a photographer later um, uh, for a number of years in Australia. And sort of that kind of uh, led me to realise that I really didn't want to work in advertising and that I really didn't want to sell things to people. Um, uh, but it was a really great skill set to learn and sort of 
I then started to use my photo skills to document um, artwork. So I, I had been asked to document a dance work by Ros Warby, who's a friend of mine, she's an amazing contemporary dancer in Australia. And that kind of exposed me to um, a contemporary art practice. And then from there, I kind of started working for other artists and then realized that actually this is what I really want to do. And so I um, um, I was also an athlete. So I used my athletics to, to get to the States um, to be able to um, undertake undergraduate studies and studied art there. And that was sort of my beginning of learning there. Fantastic. So um, as a research-based artist, curiosity is really key there and like following um, the surprises and the, the unknown. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you discovered how to articulate what that is? Because I think at, at a certain point, some artists are just naturally driven to curiosity and build into that. How, how were you able to um, articulate that pathway and can speak on it now and, and help others recognize it in themselves or pursue it? Yeah, I think it's a really long journey and um, something that I'm still very much learning about how to do. Um, I think for me, you know, as a skill, my skill set was photography, but I know that I wanted to talk about so many other different things and images alone, like a single image or a series of images, wasn't able to hold the complexity that I was sort of thinking about grappling with inside. Um, and it wasn't until I went to graduate school, um, I went to the Ohio State University to do my MFA that really exposed me to all different ways of making and thinking. And I went there to work with Anne Hamilton and she was a great mentor in terms of also having um, her own research um, uh, practice that also brought a lot of artists into the university. Um, and she brought really interesting artists that um, were sort of working in complex forms that allowed me to sort of see and um, articulate um, and be an example of how to um, sort of grapple with complexity in an artwork. Um, because I just felt like I could read a book and I could watch a documentary, but there was something in the form of um, the freedom of different forms that allowed for a different kind of learning um, and an emotional response and also information and knowledge um, and aspects of community that I think art and the possibility of working in any kind of form allows you to move into very kind of a free, like a way to work really free in that uh, kind of space. And so... Um, um, sorry, that's my dog. Um, uh, and so I think that really seeing examples of other people's work who were who were working in interesting ways and crossing forms and experimenting, and that was really the sort of main way that I was sort of interested in working. So you um, said something that I want to dovetail into as well uh, about collaboration. So this is, it is not necessarily uncommon, but it is more prevalent. It is happening more often within art forms. And your piece is, is part of like, that's a perfect example. It's a partnership between uh, you and Carmen Wynett to bring it to life. So can you talk about how you have come into a space of collaboration and what the importance is in that art, in your art practice? Yeah, I think, um, joy is a big part of it. Um, I think that so much of my work is about community and I was so often working alone and I just felt that working together is more fun and that also there is a kind of responsiveness when someone else is holding you accountable that I really enjoy. So if I have an idea or a thought about something, I can directly talk to a collaborator about it and they can be like, well, this is interesting. This part is like something that I feel like I connect with. Let's move down this sort of thread. Um, and so in some ways, it's a way to have a sounding board, to have someone who can bring a completely different way of thinking about the same topic. So in some ways, the work becomes more complex. Um, and I think in lots of ways, more interesting 
um, because you have two people thinking on it or 10 people or however many people you're collaborating with. Um, and I think that um, also collaboration offers a way to sort of grow your friendships and make lives with people. Like I would rather work with people um, and don't get me wrong, there's aspects that there's things, parts of the work where I need to be alone and I need to be reading and thinking. But so much of the work I think working together is like getting to know someone and building friendships. Like artists quite often, um, unless you're in a big studio or something, you're often working on your own in a studio or you may be in relation with other people, but it's can be a solo venture in lots of ways. And I think about what are the ways we can start to work together and to think together and like have lives together. That's lovely. How do you find your collaborators? Um, well, they've been the people that have been in my art communities. Like I think Columbus has a really amazing um, arts community. It's one of the, it's the central reason why we've sort of stayed here and um, wanted to sort of invest our time being present in this place because the community is so strong. And that's really been through friendships, through having events, hosting things, going to other events, meeting people, um, definitely through the institutions like that we've gone to school at has definitely been a place where it's made things a lot easier to make connections with people. Um, and so from there, um, but there's also uh, lots of ways that institutional knowledge kind of can also be limiting. And so that's why I've often worked with also people from my farming community that can offer different kinds of knowledge that say institutional memory doesn't allow for. Wonderful. Um, so we have a class question from Hannah. Where are all the different people you have worked with from and how has visiting a new country or community influenced you? Mm, great question, Hannah. Um, Hannah is an amazing artist also who has lived here in Columbus and now in Cincinnati. Um, I'm actually going to bring up the chat so I can see that question again. Um, I think, well, the people that I've worked with so often have been the people around me. So wherever I've been, so growing up in the farming community in Australia, I think I continue to make work about that place because it still is such an influence on me. My parents still farm in that region. And so for me, being able to grow up on a farm was like just a total privilege and um, something that I hold really close. And so making work about that area allows me to keep in contact with people and allows me to keep returning to those places. So I would say like Australia is a big place for people I've worked with um, and interested in working with in the future because it keeps me tethered to my home. Um, but then also like my newer collaborators are here in Columbus, people that I really look up to. Like I'm working on a show with Luke Stetner at the moment um, uh, for an exhibition at the Mattress Factory in Pittsburgh in November and also working with Carmen Wynant. Like they're people that I've looked up to and people I've learned a lot from. And I think if you can have the gift of being able to work with people who you really admire, it's like a great thing and really nice way to learn. Um, because I think being a photographer, maybe coming not so much from the art realm to begin with, um, you really learn by being and doing the things in the field. Um, and so working with other artists, seeing other people work and think is really helpful way to like grow and develop yourself. So in a way, working with collaboration collaborators is also another way to educate yourself too. Wonderful. So um, you've talked about collaborations and what they give you, the kind of uh, emotional resource there and the friendship, the building of community. Um, can you talk about how that's balanced with the really heavy content? Like it's, it's real content that's affecting us daily. Um, and perhaps how it's necessary to have collaboration in order to kind of survive that kind of deep plunge. 
Yeah, I think this is a really important um, question in terms of working with this kind of material, um, because I think for many years, particularly when I was making the performance of The Unknown and The Unnamed, I was in a pretty dark place um, in terms of kind of grappling with the realities that I was learning about. Um, and also sort of through the loss of both Phil and Peter as well, that was really hard to lose them through that project. Um, and I think that um, it was really making the work and articulating how I was feeling that helped me to, to in some way um, live in the world in a more satisfying way. I think that mental health and being an artist is sometimes a challenge um, that we a lot of people grapple with um, and I think that having a practice that deals with sort of heavy topics and like hard things that you're constantly learning about um, in some ways the work helps with the grieving process that I would it would normally stay stagnant inside of me um, and it actually helps me learn about it to process it and to move forward in a way I think I wouldn't be as happy a person now if I hadn't have made that work and I did make a shift I have made a conscious effort to try to work also with like the positive things that are happening like breaking water deals with like this history of colonization in through dam walls infrastructure but it's really highlighting the activist work and the people who are putting in the time and energy to dismantle this and to me, that was a real positive thing to focus on and helped me to to feel uh, to focus and to feel good about like thinking about this way of living in the world. Um, but at the end of the day, like I don't think we're in a good place. And um, I don't know if me being depressed about it all the time is going to necessarily help anyone or anything and so what are the ways that we can use art as a way to learn about the world and also to process the kind of grief that the world offers thank you um and i think we have a perfect last question which is from lydia smith you pull from so many incredible writers and thinkers have you been able to share your work with any of the writers you are in conversation with in the studio through your reading yeah, thanks, Lydia. Also another amazing artist based in Columbus. Um, uh, I have. I usually actually reach out to, um, like I never thought that this would be a thing that I could do, but when I find someone that's been really influential um, in their writing and their research, I usually just email them. And you would be surprised how many people are just really excited that you've read their work and that you are sort of influenced by their work. And I've had really good responses from people from simple things like sending more research papers, more books to me, to people like Nushka Rita, who's an Australian conservation scientist, um, to like setting up meetings, like when I've gone to Australia, or I've met with her, interviewed her, and then her work then becomes a part of, um, in a more active oral history sort of way of the work. Um, and it's something also that I want to get even better at is like, I think ideally I would like to work in a team um, with ethnographers, with researchers, with different crews of people um, to make sort of larger collaborative projects. And um, it doesn't always have to be in the art context, but that working with these kinds of people because they're so influential on what I'm doing um, that I would love to be even more actively with them in a way. Perfect. So thank you again, Callista, for the generosity of your time and talent. Um, and thank you all for joining us for this artist talk by Callista Lyon as a part of our programming for A New World, Ohio Women to Watch 2023. I'd like to give a special thank you to the co-curators, Sora Kang and Matt Distel, the other participating artists, as well as the Ohio Arts Council's board, Ohio legislature, and the governor who support the Ohio Arts Council, this great space, and of course, Ohio artists. Thanks so much, everyone, and have a great day.